Polar parrots are the second fish I've had the chance to breed. After close to a year of breeding them, I want to talk through that experience and what I've learned. Hi everyone, it's Connor. So welcome to or back to my channel. So what are we going to talk about today? It's going to be breeding polar parrots. I've been doing it now on and off for close to a year and definitely learned a lot. I previously bred mollies and it was definitely way different than that. Um, a lot to learn. It was definitely more challenging. I think it's a good kind of intermediate fish or next step up from maybe beginner live bear. I'm going to kind of cover everything I've learned from getting a pair to the breeding cycle to raising up fry to feeding them and then managing populations and stuff like that. Anyway, let's first start off with my history of keeping and breeding polar parrots. So the first year I kept polar parrots before I started breeding them, I only had males. Um, I really didn't know this until maybe four to six months and many people on this channel when I had posted videos said I had only males because I would definitely notice them breeding. Um, they are a species that pair up very easily and you definitely notice from the behavior when they are paired up. So it's very easy to tell if you have um, just males or just females or a male and a female. Um, anyway, I eventually um, got a few more here and there and finally I got a female about a year after having polar parrots and I got her pretty small but as she got close to about an inch I definitely noticed that she was a female. I noticed her swimming with my most dominant male and they kind of just hung out together and then they started to get pretty aggressive towards everyone else and kind of pick the area of the tank and then chase everyone away from there. So pretty, it was pretty clear then that I knew I had a female. And so they were kind of paired up, hanging together, chasing other fish away for maybe like two months or so. And then one day um, I did notice they got much, much more aggressive and really stuck to one area. And then maybe a week or two later, I noticed a bunch of tiny babies swimming around in the area and then defending them. Anyway, for the first few batches, I kind of just let them hang out in this tank. And so the polar parrot pair, they would defend their fry really great for about a week or so. Um, chasing fish away and it's actually really surprising that um, still so many fry were alive um, about a week after um, especially with fish like yo-yo loaches and clown loaches and blood parrots about a week after I did notice that the fry started to disappear and then you know maybe you know look at two weeks after they hatched there was really none in the tank anymore and then after that after a few months of just kind of letting them have badges in this tank and that kind of pattern repeating I ended up getting a small seven gallon so that once they had them in this tank I would catch them out with the ones I could and put them in the seven gallon and raise them up. And that's what I've been doing since then. So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, now after doing a few iterations of kind of letting them just live in here and a few iterations of raising them up and then transferring them back, uh, I do feel like I learned quite a bit and really learned a bit about how to uh, feed them properly in the first few weeks. As I think that's really the most important. All right, so breeding tank setups. So there is a lot you could possibly say here. I think there's a lot of possible setups. Um, there really is a lot of ways you could do this. So I'm just gonna kind of give a few of the uh, most basic straightforward ways, but it really depends on what tanks you have and kind of setup you have. Um, the most important thing for, if you do wanna breed polar parrots starting off is to think about if you have a breeding pair or if you don't have a breeding pair yet. So first, real quick, if you don't have a breeding pair, you're gonna have to get one. And it's very rare that you find them sold by gender. And even they're usually sold pretty small as juveniles, probably about an inch large or sometimes even smaller. Um, and they are hard to sex at that point. Um, once they do get over an inch, you can, but it's really easier to sex them once they're in a tank and from their behavior. My best bet if you don't have a breeding pair already is to get maybe five or six, put them in a 29 gallon or larger tank and just let them grow up a bit. And if you have a female and a male, definitely there'll be at least one pair. And I think you'll see that, you'll see them hanging out together and they'll get very aggressive towards other tank mates and kind of usually end up picking one area to defend. Uh, most commonly it'd be a cave or some type of hiding space under a plant, something like that, some corner of the tank. Um, but you'll know they'll be hanging out together and they'll be chasing other fish around. I'll talk more about uh, gender differences in a little bit, but that's mainly what you wanna look for. And then once you had that breeding pair, I would take those two out and put them in a different tank or you could take the other ones you have and rehome them or give them back to the fish store you got them from. Now there definitely is multiple ways to do it. Like I have them just breeding in here with the community tank with other fish and then I take the babies out. Uh, I think a more efficient way is just to put them, both of them in their own tank together just by themselves. And I really recommend a 20 gallon for that um, or larger of course, larger is always better. Nothing wrong with that. But a 20 gallon I think for a pair will definitely suffice. And now for actually setting up the tank, uh, let's look first thing at the filter. 
you're going to want a filter that um, isn't going to be able to um, suck up the baby. So pretty much you're going to do either a sponge filter, which is probably the best option, or you could do a hang on back filter that has an intake sponge. That's actually what I'm doing now. As far as decorations, you really can do it any way you want. You can have real rocks, fake rocks, fake decorations, fake plants, real plants. You're just going to want a lot of decorations, hiding spaces. Caves especially are going to be really great. That's what the parents are going to love for breeding. They're going to go in the cave. That's where they're going to lay the eggs. And just having caves where there's going to be flat surfaces, both either on the sides or on the bottom. Before this, I always had a bunch of uh, natural rock. There was studio stone just laid out all in caves, and that worked absolutely great. Um, but there's a bunch of cichlid caves. I'll link some in the description below that work great too. And really any decorations, like even now I have some artificial decorations here. Those would probably work great as well. Um, lots of options. You just want to make sure you have hiding spots and even say multiple hiding spots is going to be better. Just a heavily decorated tank will probably be your best bet for them. As far as water parameters, the general recommended polar parrot parameters are a temperature of 72 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, a pH of 6.5 to 8, or a hardness of 2 to 25 degrees general hardness. Now online, as I was reading additional guides, kind of brushing up on my knowledge on breeding them. I did see several recommend breeding them towards the higher end of that range. Me personally, I keep this tank at 80 degrees because I have clown lurches. I want to keep it as warm as I can, but within the range of all the other fish. So I've always kept it pretty much right at 80, maybe dipping down to 79 occasionally. And that's what they've been bred at. And I should keep my breeding tank, the tank I'm raising fry up, the same temperature since that's what's born in it. And that's what I'm going to put them back in. So I just keep it all at 80. Um, and I've had success breeding it there. Is it necessary? I don't know, but generally some guides have said 78 or higher is gonna be best. So now for the breeding tank setup is once they do have babies, what do you do? So for the first week, parents will take great care of them. Um, obviously you have a setup that I just mentioned with just the parents and the fry in the tank. There will be no issues of other fish trying to eat them. But even if you have them with other fish, the parents take great care of them for the first week. I'd say it's anywhere from between five to 10 days, I'd say. I'd say it's around the 10 day part that they start getting eaten. Anyway, um, you kind of have to make a decision though. If you're keeping them in the tank with just the parents and the fry, you have to decide at that 10 day, seven to 10 day mark, do you want to move, remove the parents or keep the parents in there? I've read different things online that the parents will raise them all the way up to adulthood. And I've seen examples on YouTube of uh, just polar parrot tanks where they just keep raising fry up and fry up and fry up and you know, fry don't really get eaten very much. So that's definitely possible. It might depend on the parents. I just know for about a week, they're not gonna eat them, they're gonna take great care of them. So it might have to, you might have to experiment with that. Uh, you wanna be super safe after a week, uh, take the parents out, I'll talk about feeding in a bit, so you'll be able to feed them no problem and they'll be able to be raised up on their own at that point. I'd say it's definitely good to keep the parents in there in the beginning uh, and I think they'll even help feed them and I'll talk about that again in a bit. So I'd say keep the parents in for a week and then it's up to you if you want to remove them and be super safe to keep your all of your fry alive or if you want to experiment and see how the parents do with their fry after that week. Anyway, let's go on to the next section and talk about the breeding cycle of polar parrots. So in this section, I want to talk about telling when they're pregnant, kind of differences in gender, um, the time till birth, and then the number of fry. So the differences in gender. So it is very hard to tell when they're young. When they get to maybe about an inch and a half, it becomes much easier. Although the easiest way to tell the difference is going to be behavior. And generally when you have both together is gonna to be definitely the easiest. There are a few physical ways to tell, specifically the males sometimes get neutral humps. That's just a little hump on their head that like flower horns have. Red tails are also common, kind of a little red hue. Um, the first two as well I had, had really nice red hue. Um, there's one I have right now that has decent red hue and even the other don't has a little bit. But red hue in the tail, a um, little like red gradient is a way that uh, males usually have that females don't. And then for females, a common thing they have is a kind of a reddish orange stomach. And you'll see as my one female really has that. She really defines it. She actually looks really beautiful from it. Um, and then as they get closer to being ready to breed, as they have eggs in their stomach, um, they really cut and colors come out. Um, you'll see their stomachs kind of expand a bit, but the colors get really bright and vibrant. So if you do see red orange on the stomach, that most likely is a female and red on the tail or a neutral hump is most likely a male. And the also last thing is that females tend to be smaller than males for the same age. I've actually found my females really don't get too much larger than an inch and a half, at least the ones I have. Um, although that's because I've seen once they get to the age, my adult male starts to breed with them 
and then they're probably using most of their food and energy for their actual eggs and their offspring. Now, when they're pregnant, the way to know, as I said for when I was describing the female, is she has a reddish, orange, yellowish stomach, and as starch gets bigger, you can notice um, she'll get um, rounder, and the colors will definitely become more vivid. At least that's my experience with mine. The colors get noticeably more vivid. Now, for how long that takes to hatch, I generally read online it takes about five to seven days. I have read it can take anywhere from two to seven days though, so it possibly could be faster than that, depending on your polar parts and water conditions and such. I really can't say how long mine have taken. They have always been great at uh, hiding where they put them. When I used to have my previous gape, there was tons and tons of caves and they would hide um, them really, really well. So I can't really comment on that. For a number of fry, Again, uh, it's hard to count exactly how many you have. I will say they had tons and tons, way more than when my mollies had fry. Um, I'd say probably about 100 or so, can't really tell. When I do look this up online for other people's experiences, they say anywhere from 100 to 300 tends to be the documented amount. I'd say mine definitely looks about 100, probably a bit more. Uh, I don't think it was close to 300 though, but you'll definitely see quite a bit. And then for how soon to have another batch of eggs and fry, I find it's about once a month. That's generally what you read online. There's some discrepancies. Sometimes they take longer, some maybe a bit shorter, but I'd say about once a month is what you can expect. Um, it is a pretty quick cycle from my experience. One thing I've noticed to start off is that it really varies between the individual. I find the ones that start to get larger really take off, um, probably because they're more aggressive, they eat food faster, and you can only put so much food in the tank. So I find once the ones that are larger start to go, they go much faster. I personally have found it very slow to get them to grow from being fried, being born to about half an inch. Once they're half an inch, they start to grow at kind of a normal pace of the other fish. But that early on phase is very uh, slow. I've gotten it faster, but I have also found it to be difficult to feed them very early on. Now for my fry, I'd say to go from being just born to even half an inch, it's probably taken two to three months. So it's definitely taken a little slow. So if you were to add that into them getting the full size, um, it's probably gonna take them something from like nine to 12 months to get there. So definitely slower than what I've seen from the ones I bought in stores. Now, that makes sense for me because most of the batches I've had a tough time feeding very early on, like that first week. So that is something to consider and I'll talk about food more in a bit and some tips I have in a sec. Uh, the last batch though that I did grow definitely started to grow a bit faster. Uh, so definitely have seen it pick up. Now, a few tips that um, I have for growing fry faster, and these are kind of generally recommended for any species. I kind of use these for when I was breeding mollies as well, is you want a large enough tank. Uh, one thing is I have them in a seven gallon, now they're super small as fry, and once they even get to maybe a quarter inch, I'm moving them over to here. But if you have a larger tank, it's gonna be better. You know, you could do 10 gallons, uh, 20 gallons is gonna be even better, but the more space to have, that's more likely to go faster. Uh, next, ensure they're eating from day one. Uh, now, before they're free swimming, they will be uh, feeding off their egg sacs, but once they're free swimming, you really want them to feed um, as early as possible. And I'll talk more about that in a sec. Uh, next is you want to feed them twice or even multiple times a day. Frequent water changes will help. And then having a low current in the tank so they don't have to use energy for swimming. They can just uh, use the food, their energy for growing. Uh, and a sponge filter is probably gonna be your best bet for that. Now, on topic of feeding, I found them very difficult to feed early on, uh, much more difficult than mollies. Mollies, uh, what I would do is there was this gel food by the brand Rapashi, and they would eat that from day one, and I found super great success with that. Tried this up, I tried that with polar parrots. It did not work. They did not eat that right away. Uh, it would just sit at the bottom and fungus over, and then I have to remove it from the tank. So I had to find a few other options. Um, I tried several things. I tried crushed up flakes. I tried frozen bloodworms, I tried frozen brine chimp, crushed pellets, um, and stuff like that. Now, none of those worked, at least not for about the first week or so. So the next best bet kind of is brine shrimp, and that's generally recommended for fry in general. It's kind of been a thing though that I've kind of pushed off as a future to-do item, but this kind of forced me to do it. Now you can hatch them live from eggs, and that's probably gonna be your most effective way. But um, there's a little learning curve for that and a few things to do. So if you don't want to necessarily do that, what I've actually had great success with is there's something called instant brine shrimp, um, instant baby brine shrimp. Uh, it's by a brand called Ocean Nutrition. It just comes in a little jar, they give you a little spoon. And I've had great success with that, feeding them from pretty much day one once swimming around. Now that pretty much wraps up most of what I want to talk about in the video. 
Real quick for keeping fry alive though, um, I did mention this in the bring tank setup a bit, but what I'd recommend is keep the parents with them for about the first week, at least for the first five days. I think to help take care of them. I have noticed when they're eating, they kind of let some food debris come out too, so it uh, probably helps them eat as well. But you know, after about a week, you can kind of decide what you want to do. You can take the parents out, that's going to be the safest bet, and let the fry be raised up on their own. Um, if you have the fry in a tank like this with the parents and other fish, then you definitely want to take the fry out and put them in another tank because fish will start to eat them at that point from my experience. Um, if you have the parents with the fry and that's it, you could also try and experiment with keeping the parents just with them and see if they'll raise them up on their own. Um, might work, might not work. I haven't really tried it on my own, but I'd be curious if you do. But uh, anyway, that's what I'd recommend. Parents to take care of them the first week. After that, um, on their own, they'll be great to take care of themselves and be raised up successfully. A uh, quick update on my breeding, because I had previously put out some update videos and I had said that I was going to start opening a store to sell some of mine. Uh, I know a few people have asked for an update on that. I haven't done that because I have kind of gotten busy in other areas of life. So I kind of put that on hold and I kind of have slowed down on breeding my polar parrots in general. Uh, the amount I have in this tank right now is fine for the filters to handle and I'm not overrun. So I'm gonna kind of slow down on that. If I do get more time in the future and I do get enough adults, um, I will start selling them for sure. But uh, for right now, kind of just uh, keeping the ones I have and slowing down the breeding and uh, kind of just enjoying the ones I have and we'll kind of see if I pick it up again in the future. But with that, I think it's a good spot to wrap it up. This covers everything notable I can think of from my experience breeding polar parents. If there are any questions or anything I didn't cover, definitely let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to get back to you. But anyway, I'll end it here. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch everyone next time.